Usually, the just married couples choose for their honeymoon traveling, either the centers of civilization with comfortable hotels and smoothly running systems of entertainment, or just a quiet corner with high palm trees, blue ocean, and drying sounds of wave speed. But if the story is about an unusual couple, you will never know. All the way out to the coast here. Hannah's parents gave her a car. So the first thing I did, you know, when we met was I destroyed her car. <laughs> The story begins in the middle of last century in Denmark, where the prankish and blusterous boy Ole and lawsome and fair-haired beauty Hanna were born. While studying native history, they took notice that the royal apartment in a palace in Copenhagen was occupied interchangeably by two kings, Frederick and Christian. Christian came after Frederick and vice versa. child can think it's not just succession of the names which is traditionally for the royal families, but that is intangibility rule of two persons coming into this world again and again to take the responsibility for the country. Maybe it was the time when thoughts about rebirth were planted in the consciousness of young Ole and Hana. Many years will pass before these children will grow up, meet again, and fell in love with each other. Together, they will go the long and exciting way to remember that their love started before the birth and will go on across the limits of this life. Ja, 2450 år siden var omtrent som det gamle, den græske kultur rundt omkring. 2550 years ago, ancient India had almost the same culture as Greece at that time. Socrates, Plato, Sophocles, Aristotle, Diogenes and Heraclides, the smartest one, because even at that time he said that we shouldn't fight with all these gods we never meet. But imagine that the space is already pregnant. Ole and Hannah met again when they were students. Ole was studying in the University of Copenhagen since 1960. There was a way in here. And Hanna since 1964. And I was just sitting there checking out, just see, looking at the new student girls and deciding who I would have that year. And I came by and she started shaking. I just looked at her like that. We just fall in, fell in love very strongly. Where we met first and got to know each other. And here's the university library. So it was quite an in intellectual part of the world. You saw intelligentsia and religion together here. I usually like to take a bicycle and put it in his hands. Once the police were there, they drove around and was lighting, and I was hiding behind that. Yeah. Hiding like that behind it. Yeah. <laughs> behind yeah. his yeah. block. <laughs> they couldn't see me. They drove by it. Actually, the authorities knew nothing about it. They had no idea what it was. You know, they only knew beer. So I, I wrote on that. I used to, sometimes we had three level parties. And the bottom were the ones on smoke, drinking. In the middle, the ones smoking. And on top, the ones facing out. So it was really an interesting time. It was a beautiful time. Mm. 
and he was telling a lot about these experiences. Today I advise very much against it. Drugs killed nearly all my friends. Then our honeymoon was 68. And that was out to, that was out to Nepal. Because I was writing my paper at the university at that time about Aldous Huxley. At that time, it was actually the avant-garde who were taking the drugs. It wasn't the losers like today. And at the same time, we saw that, we heard that uh, the Tibetan lamas were able to have any state of mind that they wanted, just you know, without any chemical from the outside, just through meditation. It were the same 60s, but the world was totally different. Even today, you rarely meet the cars with Europeans on the roads of Afghanistan. But back then, it was almost a miracle. Oli and Hannah were driving one of the cars and their friends were in the other. Of course, it was amazing to see different life where women are hiding under hijab and taste of the cuisine is so different, you can get the strongest diarrhea. But the main part of the journey was just started. Ole and Hana were on their way to Nepal. Their friends decided to stay in Kabul to taste the mind-blowing local hashish. Ole always needed to scare away the locals from Hana. And before the young couple continued their journey, they had a chance to saw these famous Buddha statues. They were destroyed by Taliban in 2001. At this time, you can get visa to Nepal only in Delhi, and it took some time, so all in Hana came to India. They were impressed and even excited by the exotic of surrounding world but they didn't have a feeling that they are in the company they were dreaming about. They get acquainted with local gurus, but none of them touch their heart. At the same time, they had a strong feeling that they will meet something real and unexpected very soon. Even before they put their passports in pockets, Ole and Hana took seats in the train to Nepal. These were the times when even in the city there were fewer cars, less job for the rickshaws, less tourists attracted to these old streets and the markets you can find in unexpected places. Finally, in Kathmandu, Ole and Hana felt like home. They liked Nepalese. They felt very solid, spiritually close to them, and Nepalese felt the same way to Ole and Hana. Among a lot of Buddhist temples, Ole and Hana especially were attracted by Svayampho. The unique of this temple is that the main stupa was built during the previous Buddha. And if we consider that the nowadays Buddha Shakyamuni lived more than 2,500 years ago, we can only guess the power of this place. Besides, during all these years, the temple of Svayamkhu was worshipped by Buddhists. Visitors are going around the building clockwise, saying mantras. And those who suppose that praying wheels are not too greasy, move them with their hands and perhaps with their thoughts. Ole and Hana wish to be there among these people. Ole and Hana had even more strong feelings when they met refugees from Tibet. The reason was from the events that happened more than 10 years ago. In 1959, when the Chinese communists occupied Tibet, millions of Tibetans became refugees. Those who could leave the motherland were living in Nepal, in refugees camps. And meeting with them was very exciting for Ole and Hana. 
Later, they will find very simple and impressive explanation for that feeling. After that, then, uh, when we came out, and uh, then, uh, well, first 68, we just met the culture. We were very impressed by the Tibetans. We liked them at once. They were very special. And there was like they knew us. They came and gave us things and wanted to sell things to us also because they were refugees. So we became close friends, and then we came out again in. Visa's time was over, and they visited Tibetan's camp to buy silver bracelets on the way back to the airport. Somebody told them that they helped to cure hepatitis, which they both recently had. Flying back to Denmark, Ole and Hanna knew precisely that they will be back. They still were living ordinary life, but both understood that it will be over soon. And silver bracelets also played a big miracle role in it. They really cured from hepatitis over 20 drug-addicted friends. And that's where Hannah and I used to live. Actually, the house was here. But they apparently took it away. So we went over, over in 68, we went once, in 69 we went twice and met some amazing lamas, especially the, in 69 we met some very special lamas. And we saw him transparent, no, only I saw him transparent. And I remember I held up something that was solid to see if it was something he was doing to me a solid Danish matchbox. And the box stayed solid, but he was still transparent. I could see the wallpaper behind him. So that really started some changes in Hannah and myself. So uh, it is a long history with how Ole and I um, are working for Buddhism and for his own Istiavakamapa. Um, we met him the first time in 69. And we didn't really know what it meant, but we had met Lupin Chichurimati at that time, yeah? And then we were back and we wanted, before we went out to see him again, um, I had started at university uh, with other studies and then I just picked to, uh, to learn Tibetan. So I learned the alphabet, which became very, very useful. Because when we then uh, traveled out again in 69 and we met the Solinas, we met the Kamapa, and uh, we ended up in Sunadaya, which is uh, close to that healing. And there were not really many who spoke uh, English. So we had to learn the language. And the only thing we knew was I knew the alphabet, so I could use a, a dictionary. And here our parents had discovered that this was our study, so they would, uh, they would help us with the money. We needed $50 a month to oh. live well. That's how India was at that time. And Nepal. So we were living for that and, and actually learning. We stayed there for two years. And then the autumn of 72, our Lama Kamapa said, now you go home and start something. It, we were completely absorbed in our life here, in the practice, in learning. And we had not really consciously thought at that time that we should go back. So it was a big surprise. Ole, who is the one who can really explain Buddhism very clearly and like understandably for people, he has become and was actually all the time the one who could teach and who could bring the message of Buddhism to people all over the world, independent of their background, of their culture and make this uh, connection with Buddhism. And
and inspire them to uh, practice and to learn and practice. Yeah. And uh, my role became a little different, which I think also is very much how we are, yeah? To them I was like a bulldozer opening everything because of my power and my, and my dedication. And she was the one who followed and made, put the nice seeds and stuff like that. They hadn't really liked her a lot. They were protected by me, they knew that I'd protect them and they were happy, but Hannah touched their hearts. Also, I had, of course, to, to change quite a few things which just don't work culturally in the West. There was this thing about bowing down, making prostrations when you get into a temple. I mean, free Westerners feel very funny doing that. So, in this way, you know, we, so I had to change quite a few of the traditional things, but my, I always told our teachers and they always agreed. And so, Together we were able to make Buddhism into something people could understand and use in their lives and not something strange and exotic. But we changed, you know, we, we found a very good, very good medium, medium way. So that's actually what happened, you know, travels around the world twice every year, Hannah and myself. New town nearly every day. And fantastic she could manage. Yes, this is our room. This is where we lived from 75, uh, the center for our countless activities around the world. Actually, by Danish law, you are not allowed to live here <laughs> because it's under the ground and some other things also. What we thought was fitting for us, a friend uh, put all the wood up, you know, plastered it all with wood, and we've been very happy here. Exceedingly happy. Every time we were in Denmark, we stayed here. It has a lot of beautiful memories. Half the clothes are still Hannah's. Yes, everything here actually. Uh, most of the books are Hannah's. She has more time. She had more time than I had for reading. There's our bed up here. We spent many happy hours there. We liked each other it's right to the end. When she got sick and also here, you know, what you have over here is like our altar, which is things given us by different high Tibetan lamas. Uh, things from Kamapa, many things from Kamapa and from several other lamas. The more things up here and here, you know, we Lamas were very kind to us and we made 560 centers for them. So I'd say everybody had benefit. And she was like the bridge. Um, I was more working in the West. She spent about half the time with the Tibetans. Or working for them the other half with me. And that was also what uh, the Kamapa uh, told us. And then, as I said, that everything should be like a joint uh, effort. So that's what we have done all the time and which I guess we will continue doing. We were always together. If that time the mass communication was not as good as now, but we we didn't have the internet and all that. And once in the early 60s, when the police wanted to ch ask us uh, to check us on some things, they had to give up because I always knew what she was saying and she knew what I was saying. We really felt like it, like twins. But the interesting thing is that we kept the sexual interest in one another. Often, if a couple become too similar, then they become brother, sister, never happened to us. We were always attracted to each other. Well, it's actually one of the points that has been the most difficult for the dualistic West to understand. 
our mind works in a way that we always throw away half. To make one thing good, we make another thing bad. And that, for instance, we generally think the body is sinful and the mind is very sweet. Buddhism is different. We are older, we are more experienced. And we decide that both body and mind can be very useful. Written, not so much, but we saw the English bomb, I mean, the, the English bombed a couple of times. So from that balcony up here, I saw the airplanes, the English airplanes come in. And my father was in resistance, so we knew. I remember how they came, and then the explosion. Already at that time, when I was three, four years old, not more than that, while it's still in the wartime, I remember. I remember uh, fighting in, in, mountain, in mountains, which we don't have in Denmark. And I was also always, I remember, um, you know, there were men, men in red skirts, and I'd never seen a man in red skirt in Denmark. And I was always protecting them, you know, from, from, from enemies and, and getting them through mountains to places where they could be in peace. We both recognized in 86 on our way through uh, Eastern Tibet. We were both totally shocked, you know, and I started, we were on the back of a truck. It was in winter, it was really cold. And we were really excited. I started banging on the head of the, on, on the wagon on to where he was sitting. Yeah, actually we landed more or less on some monks, you know, and we said, what was that place? And I said, it's Arubsang. And that's where the 16th Kamafo was born. <laughs> so we recognized that, we recognized that both were really shocked and really touched by it and so on. But we recognized several of the places. And I was probably tired of oddity and women with so much clothes on them. I was also tired of walking up and down mountain. Nice old houses here, beautiful Danish wood. <laughs> I was always climbing trees when I was a child. I was always up in the trees. Here's the tennis field, which was between my house here and Hannah's on the other side. I will show you the way there. And here also. Oh, we play. <laughs> I was always climbing around on all, on all the scaffolding and stealing nails. Taking home and down there in the basement, I was hammering them into, into little swords and coming up and giving them to my mother. She had a whole cupboard full of them like that. All little swords. Claire was a soldier last life. That's all possible. Denmark gave me very, very good opportunity, you know, for, for, for working, actually. Both Hannah and I, it, we couldn't have been in a better place. If Germans, you know, if I'd been a German, I would have, first I would have had to build up the country again. And secondly, I would have a bad conscience all the time. Danish was easy, it was an easy start. So that's where Hannah, that's where Hannah grew up. The first five years. And her mother was here, she was quite nervous, you know, she was running here and there. But she acted, I thought, you know, what problem? I took care of her.
and it was all joyful. It was all joyful, really. The, when she died, that was painful. While she was alive and healthy, we had a fantastic time. I parachuted, we did, we did great tours on motorcycles, we had an exciting life. I think for Hannah, 2003 was bad, but I nearly died from an accident. I was simply so tired that I forgot to, I hadn't slept for three days and nights, we'd been meditating, and I simply forgot to open the passion. It's the question of getting a balance where the things function. And that's where the symbology of the male and the female Buddhas in union come in. You'll see the pattern of the pictures and the statues are always the same. Sitting or standing union, mouth to mouth, lower part, united. And the goal is to make an energy stream moving through the two things and develop and through the two bodies and uh, dissolve duality. If we really look well, we can say that the feminine is like intuition. The male is method, always trying things, doing things. The same way, the female, on the highest level, the female is space. And the male are, well, bliss. In all, partnership is a very meaningful thing on unpersonal level. When I meet something that was one, then two, then became one again, a big force field and deep feelings appear. It works the same way when we meet someone different from us, the other sex. Openness and growth appears, something special, where we can really learn something. In Denmark, the marriage ceremonies performed by Lama Ole are legal and officially admitted by the state. Maybe the marriages are not so magnificent, but they're full of awareness what is going on and teach the young husband and wife the main thing, how to be happy. Traditional cake, champagne and taking pictures also stays. In Russia, couple blessing has no legal power, but it is still a blessing. That's why beloved couples wait long time for Lama Ole's blessing. In the case of Hannah and myself, we had it long from last life. Of course, we learned more things, you know, we spent four years in the Himalayas. We meditated in all kinds of places, got many blessings and teachings. But basically, that thing was there and it was already there in our parents. They were really so-called two-headed monsters, right? Where if things went well, they walked shoulder to shoulder. And if things were difficult, they stood back to back, right? I think Hannah and I managed to do the same. Ole is visiting Denmark only several days a year. On Christmas, traditional Dutch cuisine, a lot of friends, everything like it used to be, but only Hanna is not here. This is the first Christmas since Hanna has died. There is a photo on Christmas tree. They are together, they are happy. She's there, she's like space. She's never away.
No, what I can say is like Hannah really was experiencing. She's like space, you know. I mean, I like into meditation and meditation gets very, very wide, you know. And then that feeling of of no limit and and great kindness. That's definitely something I have for her. I just want to tell you how she died, right? Because this is rare, you know, this is real yogi. She's actually eaten up by lung cancer that went to the brain and the liver and everywhere. From the 1st of January this year, you know, from New Year, we knew it and we were together and we, she said goodbye to everybody. Then we had three months where she wanted I should be there all the time. That was her only wish. And on the 1st of April, then, uh, she died. She died in my arms, right up there, sitting. I was sitting with her. Just holding her clothes. And she was clinically dead 15 times. Every time, more than a minute without any signs of life. And then it was like, <gasps> she woke up and said, maybe I can still be useful. And then <gasps> she came back in again. Then the 16th time I said, Hannah, now you go. And then I made the sound with which you sent the consciousness out of the body. And nobody touched her face, but she had the finest little smile of her. And the energy went straight out from the top. In early childhood, Hannah and Ole didn't know each other, although they both lived close to the big park, so-called Frederick's Village. The first meeting could have been even earlier than the one they remember both. We can imagine that when five or six years old Ole was behaving outrageously in the forest together with his friends, Hannah's mother bent the brows because her small daughter woke up in baby carriage. It's good to be a child here now, isn't it? Time you had to go all the way down to the wood. Die löpen an bei. In 51, first time. I was 10, she was 5. We met north of Copenhagen. Beautiful area with woods where the moraine used to be, with hilly area which we don't have much of in Denmark. Place called No Suffering, like Sans Souci and Sorgenfrei in France, and, and, and here it was Sorgenfrei, means without suffering. You know, and I did something I'd never done before. So I was ten, she was five, you know, and I was very wild, so I just usually thought women, children, women were ridiculous, you know. They couldn't climb trees and you couldn't fight with them, so they weren't very useful. So at that time they had a fruit, they were, they had fruit in here. And we used to jump down from the branches and steal the fruit. Have dogs also, so it was quite exciting with the dogs. And this one is supposed to be over a thousand years old, this oak here. It still looks nice. I like that. So you ask me what love is, and I think it's mainly like finding something again that you make things complete and make things round. And we somehow give we somehow give meaning to things. It's like an old promise you had. Something you wanted to do together. And we did, didn't we? We did an amazing job.
but I started pulling out some bushes, you know, breaking breaking some bushes and trees together and made a cave yeah. in the wood for us to sit inside. Surely because we were sitting and meditating like that in our last lives. Must have been somewhere in here, up here and in there. The most fantastic thing was, of course, we met Karma and Lupin Situ Rinpoche. Because love, just to be happy together, is not enough. It must include all beings. You must look very far. It must look very far. And it must have, well, timeless dimension, right? Feels like here. And you see it from the position, always face to face, that what's aimed at is this uh, movement of light between the two and the energy. So from this meeting in this wood, which you just see, north of Copenhagen, you know, where we met, like we had just left each other in the last life. From this and some old promises we've made actually came about 560 Buddhist centers around the world. Last time we were together in Eastern Tibet, we know the place. This time we met in Denmark. See where we meet next time. Bye.